All right, we're going to do a couple things this morning. First, we're going to go over the Chapter 5 material. All right? And to kind of give you a, a primer or whatever you want to call it, it's probably the last handout I gave you. It's a single page. All right? It's a front, and there's a little bit on the back. And it says something like fun with loops or something like that. We're going to go over that in just a couple minutes. But first, I want to go over the material that's in <coughs> Chapter 5. All right, it's 8.12. Hopefully we can get this done around 9 o'clock or so. So again, I'm on page 189. And you can see our objectives here on the screen or if you've got your book. There's three basic loops that you have in this language. And they're the same loops that we had, those of you who were in the JavaScript class last semester. Those are, there's a while loop, there's a for loop, and there's a do loop. And we'll talk about those, revisit those from last semester. You can create a loop within a loop, which are nested loops. You can have an accumulator, and I have that in the programmatic example that I gave you. We can, we'll finish up by talking about how to improve loop performance and about some of the issues that you have when you use loops in GUI programs. All right. So the first thing that they talk about in here is the while loop. And... I'm going to write some code and it's not even going to be it's not even going to be the, the typical type of code that you would see. In other words, I'm going to write it, but I'm not going to write a whole program. But I just want to show you a few things. All right? The simplest thing is what if we wanted to write on the screen the numbers 1 to 10? Make sense? That's all we want to do is write on the screen the numbers 1 to 10. I want to show you how to do it in three ways. Using a while loop using a for loop and using a do while loop. You don't have to write this down because it's the same thing I did in the programs. All right? But what you need is you need some kind of a loop control variable that I tend to call LCV for loop control variable. All right? So I want to write the numbers down from 1 to 10. So there's my loop control variable. So I'm going to say here, while that loop control variable is less than or equal to 10, what do we want to do? Well, we want a right line, and we'll just say, now LCV equals, now imagine we left it just like this. This is wrong the way it is. But imagine we left it this way. It would write LCV equals 1. Correct? That's what it would do. But then it would go back and it would say, is it still less than 10? Well, it's 1. This would be an infinite loop condition. It would keep writing LCV equals 1, LCV equals 1, LCV equals 1, the way that it is. Because when you create a loop like this, unless you want what's referred to as an infinite loop or a loop that runs forever, you have to change the value of your LCV. Now looking at that, does that make sense to you that that's going to print on the screen? That. Does that make sense? The first time through, well, it actually it'll say what? Now LCV equals. All right. the blank lines that I can get, fit almost all of it in here. All right. So we've got our loop control variable that we're setting up at the top. We're setting it equal to 1. We're saying as long as that loop control variable, which is currently 1, as long as it's less than or equal to 10, right on the screen, now LCV equals. So the first time through, it's going to write this. Then it's going to add 1 to our LCV value, making it 2, and it'll send it right back up to line 2. 2 is less than or equal to 10, so it writes this. And, it write, and then it adds 1. 3 is less than 4 is less than, etc. So it'll do this 10 times. The advantage of using loops is if I wanted to do it 100 times, all I have to do is this. Now it's going to go to 100. If I want it to go to 1,000, 
or a million or whatever. I'm not going to do that for an hour, but you get the idea. So what you see inside of here is referred to as a Boolean condition. It's got to be true or false. As long as it's true, we keep doing this, adding one to it, check it. As long as it's true, we do this, add one to it, check it. Eventually, we print out now LCV equals 10. We've added one to it, making it 11. So now 11 is not less than or equal to 10, so we fall out of the loop. Does that make sense? And that's pretty much the same thing I wrote you in the programmatic example I put there, except rather than printing that out, I added the numbers. All right? So it literally, I think I went to 100, so it's saying 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus et cetera. And if you do all those, it comes out to like 5,050 or something like that. So does this make sense? We're going to see it again, but does that make sense? Does what's going on there make sense to you? All right. So I'm going to go down, push this off the screen, and do it again. All right. Now I'm going to rewrite this. So I don't like the way that that looks right now, let's say. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to remove that line that says loop control variable right there. And I'm going to put in here 4 And what I'm telling you is, after doing that, that's going to give me the exact same output that I had here. That works the same way. The first time we did it, we used what's called a while loop. This is a for loop. So this is creating a variable called LCV. We're setting it equal to 1. So we're saying as long as it's less than or equal to 10, do this, which writes out now LCV equals, and then when we get down to the bottom of it, add one to it. Do you understand how it's the same loop as the other one? All right. The only difference is in here, we do everything in one line. Here, there we do the initialization, there we do the test, there we do the change. So when you do loops, when you go through loops, there's three things that you have to do. First, you have to declare and initialize your loop control variable. That's the first thing. Second, you have to test your loop control variable. And third, you have to change the value of your loop control variable unless you want an infinite loop. There is some software that literally runs 24-7, 365 days a year. Would you agree with that? I mean, as far as I know, Amazon's always open. They always want your money. interesting with Amazon I bought a cord for this mic on Amazon the cord was five dollars and 49 cents and see how big the cord is doesn't weigh much they charged me eight and a half bucks to ship it all right so I was ticked plus there's a there's a problem with the cord it doesn't work so I got to send it back all right so yesterday I'm talking to Paul who teaches next door and he said well why don't you just go to Walmart same cord at Walmart they want eighteen dollars and 43 cents for it so it's cheaper for me to have it, to get it through Amazon and have them ship it than it is to drive, you know, a mile to the Walmart near my house and do that. But it is easier to, like, deal with if it's not working and send it back. Yes. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt doing it that way. So I, I don't know what I'm going to end up doing. All right. But do you understand these three steps? So this right here, declare and initialize your loop control variable. So that's step one. Test your loop control variable. That's step two. 
change the value of your loop control variable. That is step three. Does that make sense looking at it? Now, both the while loop that we're looking at now and the for loop, which I have below, are called pretest loops. I asked you this question last semester, and you all got it. Please look up on the screen here. I'm going to change this from 1 to 11. Now, how many times do I go through the loop, and why? It's not a trick question. Is 11 less than or, 10, less than or equal to 10? Not the last time I checked. So how many times do you think we go through the loop? What? None. You make the check. If the check is false, you don't go through the loop. So since it's 11, and it says, is 11 less than or equal to 10? No. So it skips, and whatever comes after that curly, it continues on there. That's a pretest. It's on your test, no pun intended. But it is a pretest loop, meaning you check the value of the loop, you check the condition, and if the condition is false to begin with, you don't go into the loop body. The body is what's between the curly braces. In the same way, if you look up on the screen here, if I make that 11, I don't go through the loop at all because it's false initially. Does that make sense to everyone in here? Because these are things that, that, for lack of better words, have to fairly quickly become second nature to you. All right. So there's three steps. When we do the while loop, we do step one, test is step two, increment is step three. In the for loop, the difference is you do everything in one line. So there's the initialization, there's the test, and there's the changing of the value. So steps one, two, and three are all done on the same line. They're both pretest loops. All right? There's one more loop. I'm going to grab that while loop that we did before. I'm going to grab all of it, grab everything, and just copy it to the clipboard. And I'm going to paste it back in again. The last loop is called a do while loop. All right, so I get rid of all this stuff here. I replace it with the word do, and then I grab this and I put it in here. All right, so I still have to do step one where I initialize my loop control variable just like we did before. But now notice what we do. We've got a do while loop. The other one was called a pretest. This is called a post test. Do you understand? I'm not checking this until I get down to the bottom of the loop. So you don't have to answer, but how many times do we go through it now? The answer is once. You always go through the loop body at least one time with a do while loop. Always because you don't test it until the bottom of the loop. So you must go through it at least one time. So if this was 11, it would print out now LCV equals 11, it would add one to it, making it 12. 12 is not less than or equal to 10, so it would fall out of the loop, all right? When you take the test next week, probably a week from Friday, but when you take that test, for chapters five and six, you will have to use loops. So imagine that I had a payroll program and I have 10,000 people who work for the company that I own. And all 10,000 of those people, all 10,000, they work 40 hours a week, I'm sorry, yeah, and they work eight hours a day and they make 12 bucks an hour. Would you agree then that I'm doing the same calculation 10,000 times? I'm not going to count, there's no overtime, there's no, everybody makes the same amount. If I put that into a loop, then I can write a loop like this and only put three or four lines in there and handle all 10,000 employees. That's why you do that. So when you want to be, re, want to be able to repeat 
a section of code again and again and again, you use loops. All right? So going back to the book, the author, as it says, a loop is a structure that allows repeated execution. That's the key here. Repeated execution of a block of statements. What's a block of statements? What you put around a block? Curly braces. Curly braces. So it can be as small as one statement. It can be as large as many statements. Anytime you go through a loop, each time through it is called a loop iteration. So if I had 10,000 of those people working for me, and again, I was going to do the same payroll the same way every time, I'd have 10,000 iterations of the loop. As it says, the while loop consists of the keyword while, followed by a Boolean expression within parentheses, followed by the body of the loop within curly braces. Now in this example, and you should get this, because this is the first thing I showed you today. If you look at the top of the screen here, that would be an infinite loop. Why? What aren't we changing? What? <coughs> yeah, the loop control variable is never being changed. So number is one, so it's going to write line, hello, 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 and it's going to keep going. If you get into an infinite loop like that, if it happens, you all know where your control key is, right? On your keyboard. Look up on the top of your keyboard, somewhere up there on the one I have, it's, it's right up above the backspace key, but you've got a key that says pause and it says break on it. If you do a control break, if you ever accidentally get into an infinite loop, that should break you out of it. All right. As it says, if you want your while loop to end correctly, there's three things that have, you have to happen. You initialize your loop control variable, you test it, and you change it. That's exactly what I put down to you, or put in here for you, right there. Declare, test, change. Okay. So they give you an example, and here's the program. Starting at one, while it's less than five, you want to write hello and then add one to number. Remember, you could have just said here number plus plus or plus plus number or number plus equal one. All right? But that will literally write on the screen, hello, 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 hello. Each hello will be on its own line because it's a right line. Okay. If we wanted to print it out a thousand times, we would just put here limit equal 1,000 and we'd say less than or equal to limit. And that would print it out a thousand times. That should make sense to you. And if it doesn't, you probably didn't read the chapter. There's your output. If you only have one line of code, you don't need the curly braces. All right? You would not want to do that here because you've got two lines that you're doing. So just get used to always using curlies. I mean, that, that's what I can tell you. Whenever you use loops, put the body in the curlies. If there's nothing inside of the curly braces, it's called an empty body. I don't remember if that's on your test or not. We'll do the review when we get done with this. You typically don't write loops like that, but it's possible you might have to. Now, in the example that I showed you, this thing, we went from 1 to 10, right? Well, I'm going to grab this code one more time. And I'm going to paste it in again. All right? We're going to set our loop control variable equal to 10. And we're going to say while it's less than or equal to 1. And we're going to say minus minus here.
does the output and everything that's in that example, does it make sense? Now we're decrementing. Okay. So now we're starting at 10 and we're going down to 1. Maybe we're doing a program that was simulating a rocket blasting off. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, et cetera. No, it's while it's less than or, yeah, right. While it's great, you're right. Thank you. While it's greater than or equal to 1, you're right. Thank you. If we had left it the way I had it, which was wrong, okay, it's never less than or equal to 1, so it would never go through it, correct? It's less than or equal to 1, though it's 10. No. No. Because we're going down. This is our loop control variable. This is what's going to go down from 10 to 1. We want it to go down until, while it's greater than or equal to 1, we want to keep doing this. All I'm trying to tell you is you can either take your loop control variable and add to it or delete from it. But you want to do one or the other because otherwise you're setting up an infinite loop condition. And that's what they talk about here with incrementing or decrementing. All right. If you know in advance how many times you're going through the loop on your test, if you know how many times you're going through the loop, it's called a definite loop. Every, every loop I've shown you so far has been a definite loop. All right. What if I'm working at a bank and I'm getting a series of deposits and a series of withdrawals and a series of check my balances type of thing? And I don't know how many I have. So I might have a thousand of these, I might have a million of these, I might have none of these. Then I have to use what's called an indefinite loop. Out of those three loops that I just showed you, the while loop, the for loop, and the do while loop, the for loop is always a definite loop. With the for loop, you need to always know exactly how many times you're going through the loop. When you're doing either a while loop or a do while loop, they can be either definite loops or indefinite loops, depending on the situation. So there's another program here, but I'll tell you what, I would suggest if this makes no sense to you, first of all, read the chapter. And if you say, well, I read it, I still have a problem. I would key in, the, there's two or three examples that the author puts in the chapter. And if you don't have time to key them in, at least look at them, play computer, and see if you can follow what's going on. All right. Notice the example they have here. It says, do you want to see your balance? Do you want to see next year's balance? Do you want to see next year's balance, etc." Okay? That's something that you're supposed to answer Y or N to. Yet, Y for yes, N for no. Okay? So that is not a definite loop because you don't know how many times you're going to do that. So that is an indefinite loop. The value that you're using, the Y or the N, that's referred to as a sentinel value. That's on your test. So if I'm going to read in a bunch of, you know, let's say that I, I want to read in a bunch of test scores, okay? And the test scores have to be between 0 and 100. Everybody with me? Okay, so they have to be between 0 and 100. I might say, put a prompt up there that says, enter a test score between 0 and 100 or minus 999 to end the program because minus 999 would never make sense for a test score. So that minus 999 would be the sentinel value. And did you notice this too? I haven't mentioned this to you, but you have links to this. I'm going to quickly show you this. Try to do it quickly. Uh, oh, I haven't really said ring it. Good. All right.
Remember these, at the beginning of the semester, I said right here and here, that's the student website. Well, if you go here, Farrell, she has made a bunch of videos on this stuff. So if you go through it and you're like, I just don't understand this loop that you're talking about, these looping things, you can go down to chapter five. It's in there someplace. There's the while loop. Hi, this is Joyce Farrell. Let's look at using the while loop. All right. Here's She'll go through examples that are very similar to the ones I'm going through with you. But if you need to or want to, you can watch those again and again. So she gives you a thing and, oh, well, look, here's a high-low. Oh, for a valid user ID. It's got to be between 1,000 and 99.99. It's a very short program. That's the whole thing. If you put a number that's not between there, it just says it's invalid and asks you to do it again. You put in a number that's valid, it tells you that it's valid. All right. So again, next is the for loop. The for loop, again, a definite loop. A while loop or a do while loop can be either a definite loop where you know how many times you're going through it or an indefinite loop where you don't know how many times you're going through it. The for loop is 100% a definite loop. The for loop has the three components and you can see them here, initialize, test, and update. So here's how you write this with a while and here's how you write the same thing with a for. So when you use a for, you always end up with less code. Some people like it for that reason and they use fours whenever they can. Since there's less code, that code will actually execute faster for a for loop than it will for a while loop because there's less code. So again, if you're still confused, look on page 199 because the author shows you how to do his while loop and then she goes back and rewrites the same thing and she rewrites it as a for loop. As it says here, this value right here, it's plus plus x, all right? And that's called a step value. I believe that's on the test also. Now, if you look up on the screen here, if everybody would, okay, we've got this. Let's go, let's go back to the for loop. So there, there we have it, right here. Somebody guess, if you don't know, what's this going to do? It's going to change my output, but what's it going to change it to? How am I changing the value of the loop control variable each time? Before I was adding one to it, now I'm adding two. So it's going to print these. Does that make sense? Because we've said we want to change it, okay? We probably have to say LCV, probably like plus equal two would be the best way to do that. I don't think we can just say plus two, All right? So we'd have to do that. Or LCV equals LCV plus two or whatever. Yes? I was going to ask, is there any difference between plus plus LCV or LCV plus Okay, that's a good question. It's actually answered at the end of the chapter, but we can talk about it now. The question was, is there any difference between doing this and doing this? And the answer is actually yes. They've done studies and to put the plus plus at the beginning runs faster than if you put it at the end. All right, just, be, just the way that it's wired into the computer. All right, so you always should do the plus plus first. All right. So again, a couple things with the for loop. If you want to, you can initialize, so that's your initialization step, you can initialize more than one thing. Okay? 
you can declare a new variable, and that's what I did. When you're doing this, now I'm, I'm showing you simple examples. I'm just showing you, you know, uh, while the LCV is less than or equal to 10. You can have a complex condition in there. You know, x is less than 3 and y is greater than 6 or z is equal to 10. You can have all that stuff in there if you want to. You can do that. So this, this test, this can be as complex as you want. All right? If I'd already created the for loop up here, I'm sorry, the, the loop control variable. So if I already said this, in LCV equal 1, do I really need this? No. So I can do that. You don't have to initialize in the loop. And there actually is an advantage to doing it this way, initializing it outside of the loop. All right, and the advantage is if I put it in here and I don't have this, now as soon as I fall out of the loop and I'm down here, I can't use the value of LCV anymore. Because since I created it in a loop, its scope is only exists within that loop. But if I do this, and I come through and put it in here and say int LCV equal one, and I don't have this, now I can use it outside of the loop. But you still need the, t the, the uh, semicolon in there. Yes? If it was just in the loop, can you pass it to something? Yes, you can still pass it and fix it if you need to. You would need it one at the beginning. This is showing that there is no initialization if you wanted to purposely write an infinite loop that went forever, that's how you do it. Right. And that's a whole thing with do, dealing with what's referred to, come on, stop it, as scope. All right, and if we put that int LCV inside of the loop, the int LCV equal one, we can't use it outside of the loop because it's fallen out of scope. But if we declare the variable outside of the loop before the loop, then we can use it after the loop because it's still in scope. Again, she's got a video for using the for loop. And then they call it the do statement. I've always just called it the do while. Now the for loop and the while loop are both what are referred to as pretest loops. You already saw what that meant. The do while is called a post test loop. I believe that's on the test. Couple things about a do while loop. Please look up on the screen here. Notice the word do. You put the condition after the final curly. You need a semicolon there. That's the only time you put a semicolon, so right there. You must put a semicolon there. You never use a semicolon with an, with, with an if statement. You never use a semicolon with a switch statement. You never use a semicolon with a while loop. You never use a semicolon with a for loop you must use a semicolon with a do while. And the good news is what you're learning right now, this is exactly the same way it'll work in Java. There's no difference. All right. So when we get to that part in Java, since you'll have done it here and you'll be doing it next semester in the ASP.NET class, we're not even going to talk about that in Java. We're just going to bang right over it. All right. There's the pretest and post-test that I already mentioned to you. They show an example in here. Here's an example of nesting loops. That is a loop within a loop. All right, and maybe I, I think I showed this to you last semester and I wrote it in JavaScript. I want to quickly rewrite something here and rewrite it in C Sharp. So I'm going to start up a new project here. It'll be very short and it'll be a console. And I'm just going to call this clock. All right, and I'm going to have three variables. Int 
hours, I'm going to set that equal to zero. Int minutes, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. And int seconds, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. All right, this again is going to simulate a clock. That's what it's supposed to be. All right, so what am I going to do? Very simply, I'm going to say four. Well, if it was a clock, and it's going to be a military clock, you could do it as a non military, but it would take a little more work. So I don't have to initialize hours, correct? Because I already have. So I put that curly in there. But while hours is less than or equal to 23, I want to add one to it. All right. Actually, since it's military time, well, it's less than 23. Okay. Then I'm going to come through here and I'm going to do almost the same thing. But since it's minutes, I don't want it to be 23. All right. And I do want that equal. And then finally, I'm going to do it one more time. And that's going to be seconds. Now, if you can understand what's going on here, you understand loops. This is going to go 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, until it gets to 0, 0, 59. Then it'll be 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, etc. Then eventually it'll get to 0, 59, 59. So then it'll go to 1, 0, 0. It's the same way a clock works. So if I come through here now and I'm going to do a, a right line, let me put my using statement up here. And I come through here now and I right line oops, hours plus a colon plus minutes plus a colon, plus seconds, all right? And hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. I sure didn't try to. But when I get all done and I fall out of this, I'm going to put in my read line at the very bottom, all right? And I'm going to run this. And it's showing me a clock. Now again, is there anything wrong here? There could be. Adding one to hours, adding one to minutes, adding one to seconds. Right. But you can literally simulate a clock, and how many lines of code was that, 30? But what we have here are nested loops. So it, what it has to do is it has to work from the inside out. So the first time through, hours is zero, which is less than or equal to 23. So it goes and it does this. And minutes is 0, which is less than or equal to 59. So it does that. Then it comes to seconds, which is less than or equal to 59. So it does this. So it's going to say 0, because that's what hours currently is, 0, which is what minutes currently is, and 0, which is what seconds currently is. All right. So again, with about 30 lines of code, you can simulate that. Now, we could have written this as while loops or as do while loops, but it's much easier to do it as a for loop. These are nested for loops. That's on the test. So when you have a for loop within a for loop, it's a nested for loop. Or they are nested for loops. And they show an example of it here also on page 205 of your text. <clears throat> Another program here, this tipping table that goes through what you should leave for a tip. There's, there's the output. It's not hard. Okay? This works great if I want to create something like this. I don't know if you agree with what I'm about to say or not, but look on the screen if you would. That's not interactive. If it was interactive, it would say, what's your bill? 
So Drew goes out to eat, and he takes he goes out with three or four friends, and it's sixty-one dollars. That's not in here, correct? So then what it does is it takes that and it says, okay, ten percent would be six ten, fifteen percent would be nine something, etc. That's an interactive program. All right. Do you use loops with GUI programs? The answer is yes. Because now we're going to get to the point where we're going to start idiot proofing our program. So if it asks you to put in a number, and you know, if I say enter a wage, and the wage must be between a thousand and ten thousand, and you put ten, it shouldn't accept that, correct? So we'll put that into a loop, and if you don't meet the criteria, we'll blank it out and we'll give you a naughty message. You know, hey, we said it's between a thousand and ten thousand. You you know, put in the right values type of thing. Now, going back to the, that one-page handout that I gave you, and that's right here. If you can't find it or whatever, that is here. This while loop total, for loop total, do while loop total. When I run this, it looks like that. Where it's saying 50, 50, 50, 50, and 50, 50, that is while loop total, for loop total, and do while loop total. When you're accumulating or adding a bunch of stuff together, that's called an accumulator. That's on your test. Now, it doesn't work like this, but let's, you know, for, at least for me it doesn't. Okay, I'm in an apartment right now. Every month I get a cable bill, I get an electric bill, I get a gas bill, and because they're jerks, they also charge me for, for using, or, you know, for picking up my garbage. Okay, so I've got all four of those bills plus my rent. So there's five bills. Okay, imagine that what they asked me to do was, you know, every when I get all those bills each month, you know, all five of them. So my rent, my gas, my heat, my electricity, and my garbage. Let's say they figured out all those bills and just gave me one big bill. So I was adding all the other ones up. Does that make sense? All right, and that final total then would be, that's an accumulator. You've already used an accumulator. You used an accumulator on your last test because you had the subtotal and you had the tax total. You added up the subtotal and the tax total and you got final total. That's actually three different accumulators. And two of the accumulators you add together to give you the value of the third accumulator. Does that make sense? So you should be able to understand what an accumulator is. All right? Many times in a program, you'll put total in there. Total this, total that. Subtotal. You know, total numbers, total this, total whatever. But it'll be in there. And typically, that should send at least a subliminal message to you that you're working with accumulators. All right? So the author gives you, again, another program example where you can keep entering purchase amounts, and then it tells you what your total was. All right, and I, so 510 plus 1287 plus 100 is 1797. It says there an unknown unassigned variable is known as a garbage variable. I don't remember if that's on the test or not, but you might want to at least look at that. Now, Colin asked the question before about does plus plus work better, you know, plus plus your loop control variable or your loop control variable plus plus, which one of them is better? So is a pre-increment better when you do the plus plus first or is a post-increment better when you do the plus plus second? That's what they talk about in this section. All right, among other things. Okay, this is really important right here. If you look, please look up on the screen. While x is less than or equal to a plus b. Let's assume that in this program, in this example right here, let's assume that x changes, okay? But a and b never change. Did you hear what I said? So x changes. I'm going to actually grab this code. I'm going to copy it to the clipboard, and I'm going to come and just put it up in here. So this is the code that we have. All right? So let's assume that, so this is our loop body in here. So let's assume that we do this 1,000 times. 
Does that make sense to everyone? I don't care what the code is. The point is, now we have to calculate A plus B 1,000 times. And although the computer can do it 1,000 times like that, it still is taking up resources that you don't have to take up. So if I come through here and I say this, sum equals A plus B. And now I change this to sum. Now it only has to do it one time. Does that make sense? Always strive to write code like that. Especially if you, if you were to work for any company which is real-time sensitive, where timing matters. And it's also, you, you're just making the computer do less. Remember when we talked about last semester that we talked about um, when you were creating a form and how you validated it on the client side because why make the server do work it doesn't have to do? This is the same principle. Why make the computer do the same calculation a thousand times? I mean, if this was you and your parents said, hey, Ethan, would you go check and see if the light's on in the other room? If I could do it once, I'd rather do that than do it a thousand times. All right? So that's, what, that's one of the unnecessary operations. Again, that's what they show here. So sum, exactly what I did. Consider the order of evaluation of short circuit operators. Believe it or not, we already talked about this, but let's do it again. All right. If I do something like this, if I say while x is less than 3 or y is greater than 7, I, I'm just making those up. They don't mean anything. All right. If I know this one, this one is going to be true most often, and I'm using an OR, I want to put that one first because then I don't have to do the second check. If I know this one is going to be false most often and I'm doing an AND, then I want to, I want to put that one first. Does that make sense to you? If I just say it to you, you might, well, yeah, it just makes sense. But you have to start thinking that way programmatically. Loop fusion, all the author is saying here is if you're going to, I don't know why you would do this when you could do that. All right? So this is making, literally, this makes 10 calls, then it makes 10 calls. Here it just makes 20 calls all at the same time. That's going to go faster. So they're talking about improving loop performance. And that, that term, loop fusion, is on your test in some form or other. Combining two loops into one. I don't remember exactly if that's one of those fill in the blank. That's a, you know what it is, but I know it's in there someplace. We're almost done, and then we'll take a break. Another program example here. All right, looping issues in GUI programs. This is the last thing that's discussed. All right, it's not that big of a thing that's in here, but again, like I mentioned. One of the programs, and, and I think we did this one last semester. Remember we did that BMI program? All right. And we didn't do anything GUI last semester in the JavaScript class, but imagine that you say that the valid range, all right, the valid range for, for a weight is one pound to, let, let's say, 700 pounds. Then you would put some kind of a loop condition in here that would say while weight is less than 1 or weight is greater than 700. You'd give them a message or you'd do something. All right? You still have to do that same kind of thing if it's a GUI program. So if you're writing a GUI program for, for a BMI type of thing where you're asking a height and a weight and they put in a weight that's out of range, you still want to give them a message, either in a message box or someplace else. There is no accounting for human stupidity. It's not a joke. It's not funny. So if the person keeps putting in their negative 10 for the weight, you're going to just keep giving them that message. That's why when you log in, you know, it, it's, it's that and it's also the fact that they don't want people to be able to break into your accounts. That's why you get three chances and then typically it locks you out. Now I could give the person three times to put in a correct weight 
And if they didn't do it, I could just set up a message that said, you're hopeless, and just get them out of the program. You could do that. It's not typically the way most programs work, but it is the way most login programs work. All right, you don't get that message, it just locks you out. How do they do it? They just set up a timer. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there could be more to it than that. All right. Similar to like messing up like an iPhone's passcode or something. Yeah. Well, and, and what, what is it in, uh, I think on the Mac, that if you, you get, you know, with, with Apple, you get like four or five times. That's the big thing that's, no, that, that's become a big security issue. Like one of the one of those shooters, I think in the Orlando, they wanted to open up his iPhone. They wanted the back door. Yeah, and they and and Apple won't let them. And I actually understand that. I'm not saying I agree with it. I don't know. I mean, if it can save human lives, you want it to happen. But where do you draw the line? And that's you know that's not for a class like this. That's for one of your fun uh, Gen Ed classes. Yeah. All right. So we went through the while loop. We went through the for loop. We went through the do loop. We talked about nesting. So you should know these terms, what a loop is, what the loop body is, an iteration, a while loop, an infinite loop, which is also called uh, an indefinite loop, I guess, a loop control variable, the empty body, incrementing and decrementing, definite, indefinite, all right, counting loop, sentinel value, for loop, step, pretest, post test. We went over all this stuff, all right? It is 9.04, let's come back. And I'd like to get you done early today, so you've got plenty of time to work on this stuff. So let's make it 9.15, and we'll go over, it'll take hopefully less than 10, we'll go over the review questions, and after we do the review questions, we'll do the test review. All right, so when you come back, have your book open or wherever you're putting those review questions, and open up that Word document that has your test review for Chapter 5 in it.